And good Friday evening. We begin top story with that positive news on jobs. A better than expected report out today. But in this economy, not all good news is created equal. So let's walk you through some of the numbers. Come over here. 263,000 new jobs created added in November. That's much higher than expected. Average hourly earnings up six points, I should say 0.6%. And the unemployment rate holding steady at 3.7%. Another positive sign, prices at the pump. The average gallon of gas now just $3.44, well below, you'll remember, the $5 we saw over the summer. And the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, the most popular option for home buyers, dropping for a third straight week, now sitting at 6.49%. Still very high, but historically still pretty good as well. Today's good news on jobs, though, first spooking Wall Street. The Dow dropping 350 points as investors fear a hot job market now will only lead to more inflation and more interest rate hikes, driving your credit card bills and those mortgage rates back up again. But by the end of the day, take a look at this. The Dow finishing in the green, the NASDAQ and S&P recovering too, but still dropping slightly. Another volatile day in a volatile year. Tom Costello has been following it all for us, and he leads us off tonight. Tonight, further evidence that good news for Main Street, more jobs, isn't always good news for Wall Street or the Federal Reserve. The government reports 263,000 jobs were added in November, far more than expected. The biggest gains were in leisure, hospitality, health care, government, and construction. Unemployment still near 50-year lows, but with more jobs than workers to fill them, wages jumped 5.1% year over year. And that's the catch. Yeah, this is a hot number. It gives the Fed permission to keep increasing interest rates. While higher wages help families partially offset 40-year high inflation, bigger paychecks only make the inflation worse. Trying to tamp down inflation, the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates six times this year. Now it will likely have to keep raising rates this month and into the new year, potentially sending mortgages, loans, and credit card costs even higher. The Fed chairman making it clear this week the tight labor market is a problem. So this is a great labor market in, in that sense. Uh, it's too great in a way because it's it's going to be adding to inflation. At the bookseller in Chicago, owner Susie Takax is paying more for everything. It costs more for employees to pay for food and for rent and for whatever um, things they enjoy too. So if you want staff in your store, you have to be able to pay them. <laughs> Meanwhile, the country appears to have dodged an economic bullet or freight train after President Biden signed a law today imposing a new contract on railroads and workers to avert a crippling rail strike. Today, the president was taking a victory lap. Americans are working. The economy is growing. Wages are rising faster than inflation. And we've avoided a catastrophic rail strike. Tom Costello joins us tonight from our Washington bureau. Tom, you mentioned there in your report another rate hike could be coming in this month, December. So many people are tracking when the Fed actually does this. So when can we expect this? Well, it's almost two weeks away now, and the Fed will get the latest inflation data the day before it decides whether to raise rates by another half point or more. We expect a half point now. You know, the Fed is searching for this Goldilocks economy. Not too hot, not too cold. They want to find it right in the middle, but right now, this economy is still running very hot, despite a very aggressive series of interest rate hikes, and we expect even more into the new year, Tom. Okay, we will stay on top of all of it. Tom, we appreciate it. We do want to turn now to politics and that critical Senate runoff race in Georgia. With just four days now until the election, a massive turnout already for early voting in the race between Herschel Walker and Senator Raphael Warnock. Vaughn Hilliard tonight one-on-one -on -one with the candidates turned to be for a final push in a big one-on-one -on -one interview tonight here on Top Story with Georgia's governor, who is at odds with Donald Trump, but endorsed Herschel Walker. So does he have bigger plans down the road? Vaughn tonight with that interview and this story. Tonight, early voting wrapping up in the high-profile Georgia runoff, the final major contest of the midterms. Polls showing a razor tight race between Republican Herschel Walker. If you want something better, you got to get out and you got to vote. And Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock. Georgia is better than Herschel Walker. Who received some high powered reinforcements last night. I'm here today for the same reason that I was here the last time to ask you to vote one more time. Meanwhile, Walker making his closing pitch, not with former President Trump, but Governor Brian Kemp. Don't believe the political pundits that are saying, oh, this, this race doesn't matter anymore. 
It matters. Kemp urging Republicans to vote, even though Democrats will narrowly control the Senate no matter who wins here. I'm fighting hard for Herschel because I think it's important that we have a Republican in that seat. Once scorned by Mr. Trump and Democrats alike, Kemp easily defeated his Trump-endorsed primary challenger and then Democrat Stacey Abrams this year. As someone who I don't think anybody would question the conservative credentials of, is it time for the Republican Party to move beyond Donald Trump? Well, that's up to the voters to decide and each individual to decide. Uh, personally, I'm not focused about on that right now. You know, I'm focused on the next five days of helping Herschel Walker get elected to the United States Senate. And I would urge fellow Republicans and other Georgians that are concerned about the direction of our country to do the same. We can worry about 2024 when the 22 cycle is over with. Leading him to not rule out his own potential 2024 run for the White House against Mr. Trump. I am not focused on 2024. We got our inauguration coming up. You're a man that can do a lot of things at once. I am not focused on 2024 right now. Now, Tom, we have seen record early voting here for this runoff at this voting site alone. You'd think it was Tuesday, actual election day. We have seen a consistent flow of voters and long lines since before sunrise. Tom. Okay, Vaughn Hilliard for us. Vaughn, we appreciate it. We want to stay with politics now as the 2022 midterms draw to a close. A major shakeup possible for 2024. The White House recommending that South Carolina kick off the primary season and bump the longstanding first state, New Hampshire, even Iowa as well. President Biden, of course, won South Carolina's Democratic primary, reinvigorating his 2020 campaign and setting him on his eventual path to the White House. The possible switch up angering officials in New Hampshire and surprising some in South Carolina. Joining Top Story tonight, Jonathan Allen. He's NBC News' senior national politics reporter who reported on this new development. And journalist Lindsey Granger, she's co-host of The Daily Blast Live. So great to have you guys on the show. Jonathan, I want to start with you. You worked on the reporting for NBC News on this story. How did this happen? And I know there's been some late-breaking details. Well, Tom, the, uh, the big news about this is that it happened without even South Carolina, the first state, the cradle of Joe Biden's victory, as you were saying, in 2020, knowing uh, Jim Clyburn saying that uh, the congressman from South Carolina, that he got a call from uh, the president about an hour before uh, the state dinner last night. DNC chairman Jamie Harrison said he was told at the state dinner by uh, an aide to Joe Biden. So uh, how this happened is Joe Biden uh, put forward a plan, told uh, the Rules and Bylaws Committee, the Democratic National Committee, what he wanted. And that was South Carolina first, uh, then Nevada and New Hampshire uh, voting on the same day. Uh, then Georgia, and then Michigan, uh, a real new lineup, uh, and one that he says reflects uh, not only the diversity of the Democratic Party, but gives the party a better chance to compete in the future. I think, actually, the biggest item here may be uh, his push to have this revisited every four years, which is going to give party insiders a real ability to shape the map in a way that can help certain candidates and hurt others. You know, Lindsay, for years, Democrats and Republicans have complained about the outsized role of Iowa and New Hampshire. They had so much power. So some voters may actually like this idea. Here's what the president said. Uh, and in a letter to the DNC, he wrote, quote, for decades, black voters in particular have been the backbone of the Democratic Party, but have been pushed to the back of the early primary process. He has a point here. Obviously, the African-American populations in Iowa, New Hampshire do not even compare to what we have in South Carolina. What's your take on this? Right. To talk about those numbers, it's more than 26 percent of black voters in a place like South Carolina versus if you talk about Iowa, it's like 4.3 percent. And so there's a big difference there. And I think that Joe Biden is trying to make good on a lot of his promises to promote diversity and make that a top issue. I know that when you think about the voter, black people, like you said, have been the backbone of the Democratic Party at larger numbers than their counterparts. And I think that it's high time, I guess, when you think about Democrats and what their strategy has been when they've been challenged to see how they're going to follow through on some of those promises, who they're going to put to the forefront. And when you see a lot of people um, going out there to vote and you think about the caucus process and it, you look at states like Nevada, people have been, there have been more than 17 states that are arguing to get their voices heard. And so right. I think that it's going to be interesting because New Hampshire, I'm sure, as you know, and other states have said, we're going to stick with what we're doing. And the DNC said, OK, we're open to changing. So this is going to be like a collision course. And I don't know how this is going to all play out, especially when the RNC plans to stay right. firm and sticking with Iowa going first. Jonathan, I want to be skeptical here and not cynical uh, with this next question to you. Do, you. do you think there was any kind of deal done, any quid pro quo, if you will, between <laughs> President Biden and, of course, Representative Clyburn when he made that huge endorsement in 2020? It turned around 
around the Biden campaign. I, I think Biden came in fifth in Iowa, sixth in New Hampshire. I mean, he, he did so poorly. Do you think there was any deal making here w w which helped Clyburn endorse Joe Biden? Or do you think this is just Joe Biden honestly thinking this is better for the party and for voters? Well, I, I'm going to go with option C. I think this is Joe Biden believing that this is the best path for him, and I'll tell you why. Uh, if you're Joe Biden, you're looking at 2020, and the possibility still uh, that somebody else might run against you, what you've said to them now is, uh, if you want to run against me, you're going to have to come to South Carolina, where I got my big win in 2020, and you can fool around and find out uh, just how easy it is to beat me there. So uh, there may be other factors at play. I'm certainly not aware of any deal-making, but this is the situation that is best, not only for Joe Biden, but potentially looking forward to Kamala Harris as a Democratic uh, candidate in the future. Uh, starting off in South Carolina could be a real advantage for her. Um, Lindsay was talking about the percentage of African Americans in South Carolina, uh, not just in terms of the entire state, but when you talk about the Democratic primary electorate in South Carolina, African American voters are typically a majority of that primary electorate. So uh, a lot of reasons for the current ticket to like the idea of South Carolina first. Jonathan, you mentioned the vice president, Kamala Harris. I, I remind our viewers, she didn't actually even make it to Iowa. She dropped out even before the Iowa caucuses. So it's, it's unclear how this could help her in any way. I do want to ask you, though, the candidates, they do have to spend time in Iowa. They do have to spend time in New Hampshire. They have to answer lots of questions. They can't run away from voters, right? I right. mean, they can try their luck. It, it worked for, for President Biden down the road in the primary calendar. But do you think we're going to lose some of that? I think people don't understand. You, candidates spend an absurd amount of time in Iowa, an absurd amount of time in some of these primary cities and states just to make the city tons of money. And it's, it's going to bring in more. If you think about your population, like going to South Carolina doesn't really change the vote. South Carolina is a heavy, heavily red state. So that's going to stay red in the big general election. But if he goes down there and all the money is funneled through there and you're thinking about black voters there, and if they are leaning Democrat, then it might give him some incentive to for black people to feel like they felt invested in. And so I think that it's a different conversation about where we're spending all our time, because if you focus only on Iowa, then that's the only vote that matters, and it might sway the perception of where voters really stand in this election. We saw that Biden did not do well, like you said, right. in any of the early primaries, and then Jim Clyburn helped him out, supported him, and immediately turned around his election, and it's really Jim Clyburn is the reason that he might have won the election, a lot of people have said. You've been very critical of President Biden and, and, and what he has or has not done for, for black voters and, and for black Americans. What does this tell you? This is a pretty bold move. Well, I think the first thing this tells me is that he's absolutely running for re-election. I thought that because of we were before the midterms, everyone was worried that he was going to step aside. Or not worried, actually asking him, him to step aside because he didn't seem to be the strongest candidate. But it doesn't seem that he's going to listen to a lot of what the voters want. I mean, his approval results and polls polling shows that people are not enthralled with the idea right. of him running again. But he's standing firm in that and saying, meet me in South Carolina and we'll see what happens. And it may backfire depending on who the Republican Yeah, actually, a lot of the last polls said they, they don't want him to run again. Jonathan, I had this last question for you. Uh, New Hampshire, they don't want to give in. The, the Democrats there say not on their watch. Here's what their secretary of state said today. Quote, New Hampshire has a law that requires we hold our presidential primary at least seven days before any similar nominating event. Our first in the nation primary is part of our culture and has been in place for over a hundred years. We will continue to follow the law and honor our tradition. So Jonathan, it doesn't sound like they're gonna go out with, without a fight, but the DNC can do something, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the DNC can uh, the DNC can basically punish New Hampshire if they go uh, before the DNC wants them to. Uh, but I think what New Hampshire is saying is we'll take the penalty, uh, what, you know, whether that's stripping the, the party of delegates at the convention or, or whatnot in order to preserve the first in the nation status. So my guess is that they will go ahead and continue to do that, uh, run their primary. And the question will be, uh, how much does the political class and the rest of the country follow it? And how much does the new news media follow it, particularly if there's not a challenge to Biden yeah. in 2024. The Republican primary we knew was going to be very interesting. We now know the Democratic primary is going to be full of a lot of drama as well. Jonathan Allen, we thank you for joining Top Story. Lindsey Granger, such an honor to have you on this show. So great. Me and Lindsey go way back. So great to have you on the show tonight. Thanks, Lindsey. We want to turn now to the royal controversy. Prince William meeting with President Biden on his final day in Boston. The prince hoping to keep that focus on the climate and his Earthshot prize while his family deals with the scandal back home. NBC's Keir Simmons is in Boston again for us tonight. The prince and the president meeting for the first time after the queen's funeral. Their personal warmth evident, joking about the cold. 
This their fourth meeting in 18 months, but William now first in line to the throne. I'm a big fan of Will and Kate. I was really excited to get a chance to see William. Earlier, Prince William meeting with American royalty at the JFK Library, Caroline Kennedy and her children. For Prince William, this is an opportunity to make some positive headlines about diplomacy and charity, moving the focus away from this week's controversy. This morning's British newspapers calling the release of Harry and Meghan's Netflix trailer a war on the royal family, while the fallout continues from the Buckingham Palace racism controversy. <laughs> but in Boston tonight, what Prince William calls his Super Bowl, a million-dollar reward for five winning innovative environment projects, helping them expand their efforts from India to Kenya. William, now Prince of Wales, following in his father's footsteps, championing environmental causes and demonstrating tonight, despite all the controversy this week, the power of royalty to rally support for a cause. It's extraordinarily inspiring to see what these brilliant young minds are, are coming up with. Something like this is um, an initiative that gives uh, a focus to the situation, which is incredibly important. There are two people who care about this planet and they care about sustaining life on this planet, and that's what I feel excited to say to them. Keir Simmons joins us from Boston again tonight. Keir, so you saw there in your story all that star power, plus a meeting with the president. But the headlines both here and across the pond are the same about this Netflix special, essentially declaring a war on the royal family, as, as, you, as you reported. Has there been any response on the Harry and Meghan Netflix special? There hasn't been a response uh, from the royals. Don't expect one, though I think you can imagine what they think when no one's listening, what they say to each other about it. You know, Tom, well, we were inside the Earthshot Prize watching, for example, the Princess of Wales, Catherine, giving out one of the prizes. I mean, there's no doubt that there is royal star power to this kind of thing. And I'm told that the royals do believe that this has been a successful week despite everything. They head home uh, tonight, Tom, and I think they do have some questions to ask about uh, whether the royal family can modernize when, just by its name, it's not a modern institution, and how they can continue to function effectively when there is, frankly, we all can see it, this feud between the two brothers. Lots of questions for the royal couple as they head home, Tom. All right, Keir Simmons, who's been re reporting from the U.S. all week for us. Keir, we appreciate it. Now to the war in Ukraine as the brutal winter conditions set in. Ukrainian officials say airstrikes have damaged half of the country's energy infrastructure. Blackouts now a daily occurrence as residents desperately try to rebuild from the ongoing devastation. NBC's Ellison Barber in Ukraine tonight. In Ukraine, winter is here. And so are the memories of last winter. When Russian forces occupied this village, Paraskovia Borisinka hid in her cramped basement. Her daughter helped her escape. When she came back, the place she'd called home for more than 50 years was hardly livable. What was it like when you came back and saw your home, your neighborhood like this? With the help of her daughter, she tried to rebuild. But Paraskovia is 87 years old. She needed more help. You have been through so much. And it's finally here. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is partnering with 17 non-governmental organizations to try and help Ukrainians survive the winter months. Paraskovia is one recipient. There are thousands like her wondering how, if, they can survive the below freezing temperatures. We are really racing against the clock. Carolina Lindholm Billing 
is the UNHCR's representative in Ukraine. There are hundreds of thousands of people who have had their homes destroyed or damaged through this war. Ukraine's Ministry of Energy tells NBC News Russian airstrikes have damaged 50 percent of the country's energy infrastructure as of this week. In addition to structural repairs, the UN is providing basic supplies at distribution centers throughout the country. The power just went out. This right here, the only source of light. There's a line of people coming in waiting to get supplies for winter. The people here, the NGOs, the UN staff, they're still working to get it to people, even though it is now dark. From shoes to blankets to solar lights, to windows to tarps to drywall, it's difficult to quantify the level of need, but one thing is clear. Every blackout, every snowfall adds another hurdle to surviving the war. In Makarev, Ukraine, Ellison Barber, NBC News. We thank Ellison and her team for that story. Still ahead tonight, a break in the case. The man arrested for the murder of a woman in 1980. What helped investigators finally solve their oldest cold case? Plus, embassy threat? A package with explosives sent to the U.S. Embassy in Spain. And the new video of a migrant, get this, paragliding over a border crossing. Stay with us. Top story, just getting started. Back now with the decades-old murder case in Florida. But now it's one step closer to being solved thanks to new DNA technology. Carrie Sanders has the story. Tonight, the oldest cold case in Miramar, Florida, may be solved after 43 years. Our detectives went back and reviewed it time and time again. We never forgot about Evelyn. 75-year-old Ronald Richards now indicted for the brutal rape and murder of 32-year-old Evelyn Marie Fisher Bamforth in 1980. I cried for two days. Um, just couldn't stop. A day her husband, John, has held on to for more than four decades after learning someone broke through the window of their mobile home and murdered his wife. Half of the bed, at least, was soaked with blood. The case going cold, but when investigators reopened it last year, new DNA testing leading them back to Richards. We decided to retest uh, uh, pretty much everything on there. And uh, we're fortunate with what the results that we got. It was a, a DNA match. Richards, who lived 12 trailers away from the Bamforts, was named as a person of interest in Evelyn's murder back in 1980. But detectives say there wasn't enough evidence then to build a case. Forensic expert Tiffany Roy says these days a match can be made with a lot less DNA than was the case 40 years ago. Well, the samples then, you would have needed a lot of high quality and high quantity DNA in order to get a profile. And so over time, we've needed less and less. Richards was convicted of attempted first degree murder in a separate case in Florida, also in 1980, and is currently incarcerated in Ohio for voluntary manslaughter. Detectives now investigating if he has perhaps even more victims. There could be potentially other cases out there, and that's what we're working on to find out, you know, if there are any. I think this is a serial killer. Police say Richards will now be extradited back to Broward County, Florida, to face first-degree murder charges for Evelyn's death. But while this case may be close to being solved for her loved ones, the wounds are still fresh. I would certainly want to see justice for Evelyn. Yeah. And... I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in this closure thing. One never has closure. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Fort Lauderdale. All right, when we come back, the desperate search in Texas, a seven-year-old missing since earlier this week. This is her photo where her family says she was last spotted. Stay with us. We are back now with Top Stories News Feed and the desperate search for a missing Texas girl. We want to show you her photo. This is seven-year-old Athena Strand. Take a good look. She was last seen late Wednesday afternoon in Wise County, Texas. Authorities say Strand's stepmother reported her missing from her bedroom after a minor argument. Anyone with information is urged to call police. 
We want to head overseas now to a suspicious package discovered at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid. Spanish police exploding that package. They say contained substances like those used in pyrotechnics. It comes amid a pattern of letter bombs sent to the EU and Spanish authorities this week, including one that exploded in the Ukrainian embassy in Madrid, injuring one person. We want to stay in Spain now. Authorities searching for a migrant, they say, get this, paraglided over the border. New video shows the migrant sailing over a fence on the country's border with Morocco. It happened in Melilla, Spanish territory in Africa. That's also a popular point of entry for migrants. Police clashes with migrants on that border back in June left 23 people dead. And at the World Cup, the man who scored Team USA's game-winning goal against Iran is back in action. Christian Pulisic has been cleared to play after getting injured at that high-stakes game. He bruised his pelvic bone after slamming into Iran's goalkeeper. You may remember this scene while scoring the only goal of that match. The U.S. will face off against the Netherlands tomorrow in the round of 16. Okay, now to the Americas, where in Peru, the president, Pedro Castillo, facing a third impeachment attempt in just more than a year into his presidential term. Opposition lawmakers insisting he is not fit to finish his term as some take to the streets to show their support for the leftist leader. NBC's Valerie Castro has the details. A show of support in the streets of Peru for President Pedro Castillo, but the calls continue to grow louder for his ouster. <laughs> It's been a tumultuous 16 months since his election, filled with angry protests and demonstrations over rising gas and food prices. Even before marking his first year in office, the leftist leader was impeached twice, at one point even accused of treason. Now he faces a third impeachment by his right-wing opposition that currently controls Congress. Ha sido admitida la moción de orden del día del pedido de vacancia de la presidencia de la república. The demands for his removal on the heels of his appointment of a new prime minister last week. A decision opposed by Congress. This is the fifth prime minister during his short time in office, fueling accusations the rushed move meant to undermine the government. Lo que está pasando en nuestro país es que la democracia está en peligro. Estamos acá porque somos respetuosos de la democracia. It's really a standoff, and it's really not allowing Peru to recover as we should from COVID and from the, the crisis that we've been going through. Protesters continue to clash with police. Those against Castillo fed up with what they see as widespread failure. His supporters were tear gassed last month, outraged over what they say is a corrupt government. Though support is dwindling among those who'd once hoped Castillo could bring about real change. Are those supporters starting to say, look, we've we've given you the chance and we've seen no results? Absolutely. It's been turnover and incompetence and, and a lot of um, inactivity. So I think, yes, most Peruvians, even those who were in his ballpark at the beginning, um, think it's time is up. All right, Valerie Castro joins us in studio tonight. Valerie, as you reported there, the opposition has really been at it against this president since he started in office. Latin America in general has taken a big turn to the left. So how are his approval ratings in Peru? Well, experts say that Castillo's approval ratings have actually slightly improved as Congress continues to attack him. They went from a low in June at 19 percent to now a 31 percent approval rating, while Congress is at just 10 percent at this point, Tom. OK, Valerie Castro, we appreciate it. Coming up next, the history of the text message. It's been 30 years since the first ever text was sent. The person who sent that very first text is about to join Top Story next to discuss how he crafted the message that changed how we communicate. We'll be right back, or should we say, the RB. Tomorrow marks the 30th anniversary of the first text message, and Americans now send more than 2 trillion texts each year. We've come a long way from the flip phone, but what did the first message look like, and where could that technology be heading? We are so happy tonight to be joined by engineer Neil Papworth, who sent that very first text message. Neil, that first text ever, two words, Merry Christmas, obviously, around the season, of course. Who had the idea for texting? How hard was it to come up with the program, to put it into cell phones? And did you ever think it would be as big as it's become? Well, it was it was designed primarily by a bunch of standards people in, uh, who designed the GSM phone network protocols. Um, 
that was like, you know, over 30 years ago. So what I was working on there was, you know, it, it was it was hard in that there were 29 of us uh, in a team that were creating this this software to do the text messaging and it was and it was according to all of these standards so you know i didn't invent it and my team didn't invent it we just we just kind of implemented it and uh, and that that's what we've been using ever since really what was what was the the, the i guess the need for what was the the thinking behind it that people would really want this and and use this how did people sort of foresee that it would be the way we communicate moving forward well back in those times people that had cell phones had those old kind of clunky cell phones that were the the analog ones that were the, the size of bricks and often sounded like screeching metal and banging banging sticks together on the uh, on uh, the when you're when you're talking and also they often had a like a pager strapped on their hip as well so these new uh digital mobile phones were going to be smaller better quality and also with having text messaging built into them you could just carry a single device and then somebody could could page you um like uh like your 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 secretary or assistant or something uh, and give you messages rather than having to to page you first and have have them call back so the like a it was like an executive assistance like tool back in uh, back in the day that's what they were first thinking of it as did did it take off at first cuz i can remember cell phones and i can remember in the beginning sort of not wanting to text you know just wanting to call people but there was always a crowd of people that that enjoyed texting did, did it take off at first it was slow to take off in the UK and, uh, and Europe, and I think that was primarily because people, you know, needed to buy the phone to get it, and also there was there was a charge for using it. So back in the UK at that time, it was it was ten pence to send a send, and I think maybe even receive a message. So there, you know, there there, there was a cost associated with it, um, but eventually it took off when when more and more people. Um, Got, got phones and also when you were able to send a message from the phone because to start with those phones could only receive and i think from what i heard as well it was slowish to take off in north america because i, I think they did the same thing that they were charging right. say 10 cents to send a message but local calls were free so people would say why would i send a message and pay 10 cents when i can call the person and it doesn't cost me anything neil did you ever think it would be as big as it's become no, I had no, I had no idea back then. I mean, back then, that that system I put in originally, it could handle sending two messages a second, and then you know nowadays we're we're doing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands a second, and you know I had no idea that day uh, what was going to happen over the next now thirty years. Yeah, um, that 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 clip that we are. played before we started our interview, it's so telling, and I wonder, does it ever keep you up at night? that the way we text has sort of changed the way we communicate. And in some ways, maybe it has made us less prone to pick up the phone and talk to someone. Well, I, I, I don't feel like I'm responsible for it, but uh, you know, it does, I, I worry about like my own kids, like with them uh, using them more often and, or, you know, not seeing their friends and just messaging them. But no, it doesn't keep me awake at night. But you know, you know, I do, I do think about it, and I do think about the intricacies of it, and and the language we use, and uh, and how how people have tended to come become a bit more withdrawn, and and just talk to each other. But but for for many of the younger generation, that that's enough. You know, an older generation feels the need to kind of meet, shake hands, and and have a beer or something. Whereas for the for the younger generation, it's often just enough to sit and message each other, even if you're in the same room. Right. And, and it's incredible where the technology has come right now. We have voice memos. We have things like WhatsApp. People want to make sure they're protected, that they're not being followed or watched by governments. Where else do you think text messaging is going to go? Well, it's kind of in every facet of our lives now. I think I think where it's going to where, where things are going to grow is we're going to get more uh, different ways to to kind of maybe even send and, and and receive those messages. Maybe we can, you know, go into kind of a more augmented reality where messages appear in front of you, or or um, you can think your text message and it gets sent, or it can get put into your head like when it's received, rather than just today. Like you know, today we can we can speak and send a message, and we can have our phones or cars or whatever read out our messages. But you know the the kind of interesting, worrying, or scary thing is that eventually it could go straight in and out of your brain. I think. Neil, do you ever do you ever take a victory lap? Do you ever like tell people when they're texting on the train or when you see somebody at an airport, hey, I I, I sent the first text message. 
Very rarely. I mean, I, I've done it once or twice, but um, it's not something. It's not something that I do to like get a free drink at, uh, at the pub or or anything like that. Because I think on the the very 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 rare occasion that I've done it, it hasn't worked. So yeah, people don't believe you. Right? It won't so, get you. It won't get you the best table at the restaurant, I'm sure. Uh, Neil Papworth, thanks so much for sending that first text message, and thanks for joining us here on Top Story. And we thank you for watching Top Story. Have a great weekend. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.